So, when you don't know how to do something, how to fix something, or how something works, what do you do? Ask a teacher? Ask your parents? Ask your friends? Ask someone you really know and trust? No, you go to the internet and ask some randos. But I'm not talking about creeps here, I hope. No, I mean the people of the internet! You know, those people who make how-to videos. Because chances are, if you're trying to figure out something, someone on the internet has already figured it out for you. Things like, how do I unsend a text? No. How do I do a winged eyeliner? How do I get rid of the zit? By Friday night. How do I get out of gym class? How do I screen cap Snapchat without getting caught? I will never know. But then there are things in life that don't have an easy fix, that don't have a simple solution, that don't have a how-to video. Things like what to do when you have problems with family, or when it seems like you have no control in your life, or what to do when someone has done something to you. I mean, clearly, they gotta go. The truth is, there's a lot of life that doesn't have a solution you can just find online. So how do you know what to do when you don't know what to do? Hey Uprising students, well it's Wednesday again at 6 o'clock and so here we are for Uprising Live and we're kicking off our fourth week in a series we're calling What to Do When You Don't Know What to Do. And, and this week I want to start off by talking about something that's really near and dear to my heart and that's superhero movies. I think we all have kind of caught this craze over the past few years, right? The Avengers movies were, were all the rage for the longest time and I remember watching them all and trying to watching them in order and, and things like that but one thing that, that really came came out of that that's been fun is is this this kind of fascination with the origin story right we all want to kind of see the backstory behind that and we've seen movies that have come out to kind of support different characters there was a movie that came out a while back um, to support the wolverine character there's a movie that i think is coming out um for Black Widow and the Avengers and to give the backstory behind that character. And, and we like this because it helps us to kind of see the little things that built that character up, that, that got them to the place they were when we finally see them in, 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 in the, the big show, right? And, and one of the things that I think can be kind of confusing though when we're watching a movie um, is when there's a kind of some backstory that doesn't seem to make any sense, right? When the superhero is about to save the day and all of a sudden they have this flashback to when they were four years old and they dropped their popsicle on the sidewalk and you're like what does that have to do with anything like it doesn't really support the the plot it's kind of unnecessary it's kind of confusing i think that in our own lives we have moments that are making up our backstory for a future us but in in, in the moment when we're experiencing them we don't really know how they fit they're, they're difficult to understand in the now We've, we've been asking this question over the past few weeks, what to do when you don't know what to do? What to do when you don't know what to do? And today we're going to be talking about what to do when you don't know what to do when bad things happen. Maybe you have a relationship with a friend that all of a sudden collapses because of a big fight and you don't know what to do. Maybe you have your parent come home and tell you that, that your parents are going to be splitting up and you're going to be moving to a different house or, or maybe your, your dad or your mom comes home and tells you that they got a new job, but that means you're going to move. Or, or maybe you had a relative who came and said, hey, the cancer's back. We're going to have to go through chemo again. All these things can leave us sort of confused, sort of, sort of desperate, right? When, those moments when life gets real, it can be really hard. And, and <clears throat> before we can begin to ask the question what to do, I think we first have to ask the question why. Why is this happening? Why is this part of my backstory? How is this going to help me? Most of the time, the difficulties in our lives, those moments that, that leave us in this place, feel random, pointless, and unnecessary. Sometimes, sometimes we'll see the point later. We'll look back and we'll realize that that relationship, even though we thought that it was something we wanted at the time, we've become a better person because it did collapse. Sometimes we may even begin to see in the moment that while we, we don't like the fact that we're getting called out or, or in practice or something, we know that it's going to make us better at whatever we're, we're trying to achieve, whether it's a sport or a band or whatever. But most of the time in those moments when, when we're going through the difficulty, when we're going through that stuff, it doesn't seem to make sense at all. 
real life isn't a movie either, right? That's that's the thing is when we're watching a movie and and, and there's a struggle, we're kind of we're kind of okay with that because we know that within an hour and a half it's all going to be tied up with a pretty little bow, unless you know you're watching Infinity War, in which case you got to wait six months for the next movie. But spoiler alert, by the way. But other than that. We kind of know that movies are going to work themselves out, but when it comes to our life, we don't have any guarantee that it's going to fix itself in the next hour and a half, or the next week and a half, or the next 10 years. And so sometimes those moments can feel really difficult. And with that in mind, we're going to jump back into this guy we've been talking about named Joseph. So to recap, Joseph is this guy who's the, the second youngest of, of 12 brothers, right? He's, his, his dad has, has f- two wives, two baby mamas, all kinds of drama in this family, and Joseph is the favorite. Joseph has the fancy coat. Things seem to be going good for Joseph until one day his brothers decide that they've had enough. They beat him up. They throw him in a hole. They sell him into slavery. He's hauled off to Egypt, and he ends up serving in the house of a guy named Potiphar. He's kind of doing okay there. He's kind of trying to make the best of the situation. And then one day he's falsely accused by Potiphar's wife and thrown into the dungeon of the prison. He is, he is absolutely, if anybody has ever had the right to look at God and say, why is this happening to me? How is this making anything in my life better? Why is this part of my backstory? But Joseph's story doesn't end there, right? Joseph's story continues. And we're going to look at that today when all of a sudden Joseph ends up making two new friends. We're going to pick up in Genesis chapter 40, uh, beginning in verse 1. Genesis chapter 40, verse 1 says, Sometime later, Pharaoh's chief cupbearer and chief baker offended their royal master. Pharaoh became angry with these two officials, and he put them in the prison where Joseph was, in the palace of the captain of the guard. So Joseph is chilling in prison, and what happens is Pharaoh, who at this time was the most powerful person in Egypt, which was the most powerful country in the world, so in essence, this was the most powerful man on earth, and he just got kind of mad at the cupbearer and the baker. I don't know, maybe they were, you know, looking at him wrong. Maybe they were dancing one day, and he didn't like how they were doing the dance, and so when you're the most powerful person in the world, and you want someone thrown in jail, that's all he had to do, and so they end up in jail with Joseph, right? Pharaoh got big mad, and that's all that mattered. And so they end up getting thrown in jail, and they end up meeting this guy named Joseph. And check out what happens next. Uh, Chapter 40, verse 4. They remained in prison for quite some time, and the captain of the guard assigned them to Joseph, who looked after them. While they were in prison, Pharaoh's cupbearer and baker each had a dream one night, and each dream had its own meaning. When Joseph saw them the next morning, he noticed that they both looked upset. Why do you look so worried today, he asked them. And they replied, We both had dreams last night, but no one can tell us what they mean. Joseph says, Interpreting dreams is God's business. Go ahead and tell me your dream. So, first of all, let's just notice a few things that are happening right here off the bat, right? Because we talked about how that backstory is necessary to, 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 to finish the, the finished product, and already we see that what's going on in Joseph's life has changed him some, right? Because you remember back a few weeks ago, we talked about this dream he had about these, these stalks of, of, of wheat bowing down in his dream, and these stars in Joseph's dream, and Joseph came to his brothers, and Joseph told them what his dream meant. He said, don't you see, it means that I'm going to be more powerful than you. But look at what Joseph does here. He, he, he doesn't do that. He says, doesn't doesn't interpreting dreams belong to God? He's already grown a lot just in this little bit of time. He's got more growth to come. And so what happens next is, is in the rest of chapter 40. I'm not going to read it verbatim, but I'm going to kind of you know, summarize this story. Basically what happens next is, is Joseph listens to the two dreams of the cupbearer and the baker. And he says, hey, I actually I do have the ability to interpret those dreams. God has given me that gift, and I'll, I'll let you know. First to the cupbearer, he says, hey, really cool. Um, you're not going to be in prison much longer. Because Pharaoh is going to find favor with you again. You're going to be restored to your position next to Pharaoh. And, and then he says to the, cup, uh, the, the baker, he says, hey, I guess I have good news for you too. You're, you're not going to be in prison very much longer because you're not going to find fa- favor in Pharaoh's eyes. In fact, he's going to kill you. Um, so there's that. And, and that's not great, but he was right. It's what happened. And, and so he tells the cupbearer, though, he says, listen, I'm not supposed to be here. Here's my backstory. Here's how I got to this point. And, and when you get back in favor with Pharaoh, what I want you to do is you're his cupbearer. You're right next to him. I need you to tell him about me so I can be released from prison. 
Cupbearer gets out of prison, just as Joseph said. But he's a little worried, right? Because, you know, he defended Pharaoh once. What if he does it again? So instead he decided to do nothing. And so Joseph just sat there. Joseph just sat there in prison thinking, I thought this whole thing was leading up to here. I thought my backstory was, was leading up to this point where I would be released. But instead, here I am. And Joseph didn't have to wait an hour and a half for it to work out. He didn't have to wait a few weeks. In fact, Joseph sat in that prison for two more years. For two years, he just sat in prison. Likely thinking this was the rest of his life. Then one day, Pharaoh had a dream. And he's asking everybody, he's like, man, someone's got to interpret this dream. And the cupbearer now sees the opportunity to say, hey, this will actually help me. So he says, hey, Pharaoh, I know a guy. He interpreted a dream for me once. I think he could help you out. His name's Joseph, and he's in prison. Joseph, all of a sudden, one day, they come and they say, Joseph, get up. They take him out. They put nice clothes on him. They give him a haircut, and he's standing before Pharaoh. We'll talk more about the rest of the story, but he, he interprets the dream. Pharaoh finds so much favor in him that he promotes him not only out of prison, like, so that's great. You know, when you're a prisoner, you're kind of like the lowest of the low. He promotes him. And he ends up being the second command to, to Pharaoh. So he becomes the second most powerful person in the world from prison. All because of that backstory that seemed pointless and meaningless and hopeless at the time. But after he waited, he realized that the difficult circumstances in his life positioned him and prepared him for something great and something only he could do. You see, God was working, and we're going to see next week that not only that, but God is working to save his people that we'll know as the nation of Israel. He's, he's saving his promise to his people even through the negative things that happened. The same is true for you and me, you know. Sometimes we don't see what's going on, but the difficult situations in our lives are positioning us and preparing us for something only we can do. And, and it doesn't mean that every bad thing that happens to you is from God. It doesn't mean every time that you have a bad day or, or that, that, that someone breaks up with you or that you, you have a family member who is diagnosed with an illness, that God did that. The truth of the matter is that we exist in this world that is still marred by sin. While we may be free from, from the power that sin holds over us, because of, of Christ's blood, we are not free from the presence of sin in this world. And bad things often happen because of sin and because there are bad people. But what's encouraging is even the bad thing that Joseph's brothers did to him by selling him into slavery, God was able to use and, and, and to do a complete 180 and saves an entire nation, saves his promise to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob because of the bad thing they did. He used it to position Joseph to be prepared. God is, is great at turning things around. So if, if, you're, if you're ever in one of those situations, you're not sure, I want you to, to remember what it says in Romans chapter 8, verse 28. We know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. Here's, here's the main point I want you to understand tonight. It's going to be right here on the screen when you don't know what to do, remember that your problems can position you for a purpose. When you don't know what to do, remember that your problems can position you for your purpose. It doesn't mean everything will always feel nice, but leave room for God. In those moments when you feel like, man, this is horrible and I just need to escape this situation, before you, you decide that that's the answer, maybe leave room God, for God to say, actually, I'm going to use this situation. I'm going to need you to wait here a little longer. It may be more than an hour and a half. It may be, like Joseph, it may be two years. It may be ten years. But trust that God has a plan for your life. The hardest and worst things we experience aren't the end of us or our story. In fact, they are often part of something much bigger. The hardest things in our lives aren't the end. Because God wouldn't let that happen. 
right? God is, God is continuing to use those things for a purpose. And so there's two things that I want you to understand and how you can kind of say, okay, what do I do with that other than just try to have a pep talk and, and, and grit my teeth and bear it when I have tough times? There's two things I want you to do if you're going through those difficult situations and you're wondering, how can this be part of my backstory? How can this be building me up to something better from God? Number one, remember that no one else has your life story. There's no one else who's ever existed on this planet that we call Earth who has ever had your experiences and your background. And, and it is making you into someone who is unique. In all of creation, you are uniquely you. And so you have the position to do something with, with God working through you that only you can do. And, and you may not know what that is yet. In fact, if you're still in middle school or high school, there's a good chance you hadn't figured that out yet. I know that because I'm in my 30s and I haven't always got everything figured out as to how these bad things are going to help me do what only I can do for God. But know that, that, that it is true that no one has the backstory that you do. You have a unique story and it's positioning you for unique, unique work that only you can do. But the second thing is remember that your story does and can interact with others. You may not have the exact story as anybody else, but you may have similar experiences. And sometimes the main reason why going through those troubles can be, can be vindicated and we can realize that it's, it's, it's positioned us is because someone else ends up going through them and we can be there for them. Maybe your family has lots of drama and you've, you've seen some splits and some relationships. And so when your friend comes to you and confides that, that his parents are getting divorced or her parents are getting divorced, you can say, hey, man, let's talk. I know what you're going through. I know how that feels. And all that pain and all that confusion you may have went through before all of a sudden seems to make sense in a moment where you can provide clarity for another person. Maybe you've, you're the kind of person that you just get broke up with a lot. Maybe you're like me when I was in high school. And I, I don't know why, but, you know, for whatever reason, just girls broke up with me a lot. Maybe you can use that experience when someone else goes through a difficult breakup to say, look, I know how you feel. I know what that's like to be rejected. Maybe, maybe you've dealt with sickness or illness. Maybe you've personally had sickness or illness and you've, you've, you've had to struggle through that. Or maybe you've, you've witnessed a family member or someone you love closely have to go through a really serious sickness or illness and that positions you better when someone else you know has to go through the same thing. Or maybe, maybe you have serious doubts about your faith. Maybe you have serious doubts about, about who God is or, or, or even your own self-image. And maybe you can use those experiences so that when someone else is going through that, you can say, hey, it's okay. It's okay to doubt. It's okay to struggle. I was there too. Let me tell you about my experience. And let me show you how God has worked through that experience. You have to have someone who you can share those things with. The, the greatest strategy of our enemy is to leave us alone. And that's why we have, have been telling you over the last few weeks that we are making this huge push to move everything we do in student ministry around small group discipleship. And one of the ways we're going to do that is you are going to have uh, two, not just one, but two small group leaders who are going to be there for you, who are going to be your point of contact. Not that you can never contact me or, or Katie, but you can contact... <coughs> Your small group leader, they want to be there in your life. And, and we've already got these leaders. Um, they've, they've volunteered. They've, they've been willing to give their time. When we begin to meet again, they're going to meet with you on Sunday nights. We're going to, to center everything we learn in small group around a small, uh, or excuse me, in student ministry around a small group discipleship model. But even, even before we do that, as we get ready to kick off a new school year, a new student ministry year in August, um, those small group leaders are going to begin to reach out to you. And we're going to see what that looks like. Maybe... Maybe you have a small group meeting on Zoom. I know that's not the most appealing offer, but we believe that, that putting ourselves in Christian community is, is the most valuable thing we can do for you as a student ministry. Joseph went through pain that felt pointless. But when we see his backstory, we see that God used his problems and positioned him for a purpose. God took, him, took his impossibly bad situation and used it to create unimaginable good down the road. And we'll talk more about that next week. But for now, imagine if he could do the same for you. What if God used your painful situation to position you for something amazing that you haven't even imagined yet? And what if the first step to getting there 
was simply asking him to come alongside you and to help you. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for tonight. We thank you for this ability to come via live stream again. Um, Lord, we ask that your message would just permeate through our, our screens and our speakers and into our ears and our hearts, and that, God, we would be changed as we, we realize that the difficult situations that we're going through, while they may seem pointless and they may seem to have no, no purpose, that, that, that they are positioning us to do what only you can do through us. God, I ask that you would quickly heal our land, that you would heal the sickness that is COVID-19, and you would bring us back together so that we can come and we can in, in celebrate in fellowship that the difficult times that exist in our past and our backstory have brought us to become the people we are, that they have positioned us for a purpose. God, I ask that you would, you would help us right now if we're struggling with something in our hearts, that we wouldn't struggle alone, that we would reach out to to a trusted friend or an adult or, or, or a small group leader or, or even a student pastor. But God, that we would always trust that you have a plan that is bigger than our situation. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.